All right. Well, Stephen Cervantes, here we are back again. Yes, indeed. Good to be here. Yeah. Been a while, it seems. I'm glad to be back in front of this microphone. Yeah. Well, uh, you have once again just uh, dumped a bunch of papers in my lap, <laughs> and at good. the top it says "Understanding Male Sexuality." So I'm I'm absolutely looking forward to where this may go today. Oh, uh, so I have to. My mind just bounces at times, as so I have to sort of bring people along. I was talking once, and somebody said, "How did you go there?" From, from this thought to that thought. So I'm reading this book on, um, it's, the author talks about the metaphors for illness. Why does illness happen? What does illness do to us? So of course, being the sexual guy, what are the metaphors for male sexuality? What have you heard? What ideas and how people try to present it before? And what's your understanding of, of, of a male sexuality? So I heard a speaker say once, uh, male sexuality is like giving a shotgun to a 12-year-old, okay? <laughs> and saying, okay, be smart. Be careful, right? Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. Don't do dumb things, okay? Now he's 12, and we give him a shotgun, right? Mm -hmm. So first, he's very careful. He shoots at the ground and cans and stuff. Well, and then he sees mailboxes, and he shoots at one of those now he crossed the line of destruction then he's walking down the road and there's a highway sign you know i bet those signs cost a couple hundred bucks somebody digs a hole got to order a metal plate got to get it in the mail got to pay a laborer to put it up he just shoots a sign you know what's he do he doesn't think he's doing anything wrong mm -hmm. but he crossed the line with a shotgun and then he sees something flying right and then the story goes on and on and it's like a 12-year-old with this very powerful thing called male sexuality. Well, I thought that was kind of an interesting. Well, any thought come to mind when you hear that? Yeah, no, I would, I would say that's pretty accurate. And, um, uh, you know, thinking about it from the 12-year-old's perspective, how exciting is it yes. to get a shotgun? Yes. You know, now at the same time, um, how terrifying is it as a 12-year-old to use shotguns? Because you're like, okay, I, I don't know how to use this. I don't really know what I'm doing. So it's kind of like these, I think that metaphor is good because there's a lot of mixed feelings that happen, yeah. especially when especially when puberty hits, you know, and, and, yeah. and hormones start to change. You do have a sense of total thrill and total terror, yeah. you know, because you don't know what you're doing, but it's also really exciting. And the brain's not developed to 25, so right. what the heck? You know, we got a few years to figure this out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's one metaphor. Another one is this one I've sort of thought up <clears throat> myself. I thought God gave men bigger muscles, more height, big backs, deep voices, and put them in charge. Um, and then he said, okay, I got to make sure this guy doesn't think he's a God. So I'm going to give him something to struggle with all his life. Oh yeah. Sexuality. Okay. That's it. So he can be the leader, but, but he, he's going to be humble because he's going to have something that's very difficult to control. Mm. Mm. So I always thought, okay, that was God's way of humbling man because Look, if you ask any man, if you ever struggle with your sexuality and they say no, then you just buy a liar bumper sticker and just put it on their car. I mean, you know. Yeah, that's a completely detached <laughs> man from himself. Yeah. So so the, the, I thought God's doing this for humility so we can come back to him and put our face down and say, sorry, God, I messed up. I messed up. Here I am again. You're the God. I'm not. I'm the human. I'm the being. I'm the screw up. But, but you know, you got me covered. So good. So that was, that was a, a thought I, I've had for a very long time, was it was farm humility for us to battle, to, to realize all our life we're in a battle. And I told that to a guy, and he said, that is absolutely wrong. Hmm. I thought, well, I was feeling pretty good before <laughs> this conversation. You know, I thought I was a leader and smart, and I thought, man, there are guys that will buy what I just said. But what I love about brothers, they will get right in your face, you know. And there's something about guys getting in your face that's different than women getting in your face. Mm -hmm. You know, there's another, like, equal being, a male to male saying, no, 
No, you got it wrong. It's like I just immediately went humble because this is a smart guy. And uh, he starts, he says, God didn't make a mistake and God's not trying to torture us, Mm -hmm. you know. He said, we're made in the image of God in our sexuality is part of that. Now I'm stepping back on you. Wait a minute. I, that that's a very powerful picture. Mm-hmm. That God in God designed man. Then he designed woman, right? And he man, he made man exactly like he wanted men to be. There's no mistake. All this power, all this energy means we're made, it indicates we're made in his image. We, we look like he wants us to look. What are you thinking? Yeah, I, th- I think your, uh, your friend is, is a good friend to have. <laughs> uh, because the reality is, is the struggle that you talked about, the, the humbling that you talked about, that's post-fall. That's post sin entering. Mm. So what sin did was then give us a distortion of our understanding of our sexuality and our ability to even manage it well. Sin just mm. sin sort of clouds everything. But the reality is is Adam was a fully formed male before sin entered the world. So you're so that's correct in the sense of like God didn't make a mistake by giving him sexuality, by making him male and making the woman female. That was all part of the design. So there is something of that when you talk about the the way that our our bodies function, the testosterone mm. that a man has, the all of those things. It's it's like God looked at that and he says, Very good. That's exactly right. how I intended to design you. There's not a mistake when all those hormones go raging around 10, 12, 14 years old. Mm. All of that is part of the design. And so in a sense, um, I'm not saying that even in a perfect world that um, there wouldn't be a sense of excitement and thrill and maybe a, a need to understand how do I steward this, but sin just magnified that struggle to where we became more self-focused in that. But I think, That's I think good. it's absolutely right. The design was there. So in some way, then I think the question we have to ask is what does that mean then to my identity as a male, as a man to be made in God's image as a male? Okay. What does that, how am I to live then? How am I to steward that? How am I to be the best man that I'm actually designed yeah, to be. Yeah, but you're asking a question, and what what have you attempted an answer? Because that, that's a great question. How am I to be? Mm-hmm. You, you have any more follow up thoughts on that? Oh, or? we got a lot of thoughts on that, but I don't know if that's where we're going today. Oh, for okay, but for that, but that whole idea. I want you to keep building on the model of what you just said. Who are we supposed to be? What are we supposed to be? And as we unfold this thing, so. If man is made in the very image of God, our sexuality is part of God's design. And strong sexuality and and the strength of sexuality helps us look like God. Right? There's something different in the dialogue that's emerging now because sexuality is seen as a bad thing and an out-of-control thing and a... um, a dangerous thing and you know male sexual so much damage has been done that it's like man you just got to be careful men are crazy you know mm-hmm. and or yet it's seen as an idol mm-hmm. like it's worshiped you know think about things like like pornography and like uh, all the things that are going on in the sexual revolution movement it's like now it's 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 this weird dichotomy right on the one hand we're saying um it's it's awesome. Do everything you want with it and fully express yourself. On the other mm. hand, we're saying, oh, it's dangerous. It's killing people. It's hurting people. It's it's abusing right. people. You know. So it's kind of like, well, how, can you two have, opposites? Yeah. That's good. So he gave men power, and we're talking about men and sexuality, right? So we'll go back and forth. And he gave men the ability to fight, to be aggressive, to be energetic. And this is manhood and sexuality, and this interplay between the two of them. And there's something about that where God says, that's me. Mm -hmm. That's me. I fight. I can be angry. 
I can fight righteously. I have energy, right? There's something about a man that looks like God. We have the ability to create and we have the ability to dominate. Mm-hmm. We're men. Yeah, and I think uh, that's part of unpacking that. And of course, I think it's important that our uh, this maybe sh- goes without saying, but sometimes I think you got to say stuff that goes with that may seem like it goes without saying. Th- this particular episode, we are only looking at male sexuality, so we don't want. I mean, don't send us the emails that say, "Hey, you're missing the whole." other half the whole female is yeah we understand that we're only talking about guys here so please don't get offended when we are really just trying to uh, overly focus on the the male sexuality here um but you're right Stephen, and and also to just finish my thought there so what that means is while i do believe a man is is made in the image of God in the fullness of what that means, and a woman is made in the image of God in the fullness of what that means. There is a distinction, and only together do we have the full image of God. Mm. So we need to recognize that. That's good. Now, now we're not splitting God's image in half. I mean, we a, a male is made in God's image, a female is made. In, but does that make sense? I mean, we're like w- when you're talking about things like you know, power and dominion and some of these types of things, authority and responsibility and all that. Um, we're looking at that through the male lens in terms of how God has designed us in his image in that way, right? Yes. And I think it is important that we reclaim the goodness of that. Because mm. you're right, in our culture today, even in the church today, I think there is a an unhealthy negative view towards uh male sexuality in particular, right? The idea that when you're talking well, about things un- like so strength... Well, misunderstood, right? Well, yeah. when you're talking about things like strength and power, what do a lot of people hear? Oh, yeah, abuse, domination in the sense of, like, uh, oppression. Right. Not thinking of, like, well, strength and power for justice and righteousness and protection yes. and, and helping and all of that. That's good. So sexuality and power is found stronger in men the strength, right, of man. And that strength is a reflection of God and his strength. God strongly stands against evil. And that's what he wants men to do also. Mm-hmm. Strand, stand for good and stand against those that uh, stand for evil, advance evil, you know, pr- promote evil. You can see the fury of God in some men, the, the fervor, the energy, the passion when men are fighting for good. Mm-hmm. Some of that comes from the very testosterone, the energy that exists within a man. Yeah, I actually, uh, one of the things that we bring up so, uh, a little bit in the, the workshop that we do is this understanding of righteous anger. Mm. Uh, and the reality is that we're actually told to be angry, but just don't sin in our anger. So there is a sense in which that energy that can come up in a man, especially because of like you've been talking about in terms of just our our form and 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 bodies and all of that, there is a sense in which we should have a righteous anger against evil. Listen, S- Stephen, if somebody comes after your daughters, right? What's going to happen? All my manhood. I'm telling you what, all there's I a got. righteous anger there, That's right? right? You got it. So God wants men to use power in a harnessed manner because God and good are the same thing in my mind. Anything good is God, and God is good. And our power and, and standing on right ground is for, is, is where we want to vent our power in the fight for good. So male sexuality is the spark of life in a man. Is, is male sexuality bad? A lot of male sexuality is driven by testosterone, right? And it makes a man a man. But, and so we have to be careful because we have passions and we have drive and we have desires and we have this spark of energy and we have to use it wisely. Male sexuality has to be used wisely. And this is where I think the, the redemptive message comes in. Yes, has there, have there been a lot of abuses of male sexuality? Absolutely. Not, you know, there have been, there's certainly been abuse and domination and oppression and those kinds of things. Um, 
but but we need to recognize that part of the salvation that we've been given mm. through Christ is to have a reforming of those desires, a redirecting mm. of those passions. Yes. And so I think this is where I th- we need to call out men in, in some ways, kind of like the way your friend called you out and said, hey, you're wrong, Stephen. <laughs> That's true. Can we call out our brothers and say, you know what, yeah. if you are using your power, if you're using your desires mm. in a way that is harming somebody else or manipulating someone else, or yes. then guess what? You that's wrong. You need to you need to be called up mm. to actually using your male sexuality, your your maleness in a way that is redemptive and good. So then he makes this statement, this guy that I'm talking to and making notes from his comments and sort of building on. He says, what, a, what do you have if you take away male testosterone? You have a woman. I thought, oh my goodness. Now, this is a physician speaking, okay? Mm-hmm. It's not just somebody made a kind of interesting statement. Because males are a lot of testosterone and some estrogen, and women are a lot of estrogen and some testosterone, right? And so, male sexuality is God's design, and it shows us an aspect of God through power and strength and use of passion and desire and the fight for good. And it is exactly his creation. There's something beautiful about the power of men. Mm-hmm. And that and that idea of what happens if you take away male testosterone, you have a woman. That's exactly what I was saying earlier. It's like, okay, l- listen, we're not saying that that men are all there is. I mean, obviously, there there wouldn't be any more men on the planet if there weren't women, right? <laughs> right. So every every man has been born of a woman. So, um, but the idea here is, I think, just being able to. I like the way you said it. That sexuality is a is a is a way for us to see an aspect of God yes. in his creation. Like it's a lens through which we see it. So I think it's important. I, this has been, I've been, th- I've thought about this a lot and it's also, it's helped me to become, I hope a little bit better listener oh. to women because I have to recognize I can only see life through a male perspective. Right. Like, That's right. I, I can try as much as I might to empathize with my wife or to under, The reality is there's a point at which that stops because I'm a male. <laughs> and, and I'll so, never be a female. But, that, living but I want to listen. I want to become a better, better listener. Right. But it is good to remember that. And, and also, that doesn't mean that we're stunted. It, it means that we need to recognize there's something good about God saying, Stephen, you're a male. You're going to see life through a man's lens. Your sexuality and everything about that is going to see things through that lens. Yes, and it's okay. Yes. It's okay to have that limitation, if I could put it that way, that you can't see everything from every perspective, mm. that you're seeing it through a man's eyes. And, hey, you're made that way, so that's actually good. So God knows man's heart, and he knows the male sexual struggle. And he loves his men. Mm-hmm. That sometimes we think God's ashamed of us. Mm. God doesn't like us. God thinks we're bad. Um, and and he knows the difficulty of the male sexual struggle. And he knows men mess up, and because of who he is, he loves. Mm-hmm. Right. God is love. He can't help himself. He shows up as love, right? I know there's judgment and condemnation. That that has to happen. But he loves to love. That's his identity. And so we struggle. We mess up. We fall down. We call ourselves names. But he always shows up as love and Mm -hmm. says, you're mine. Yeah, yeah, you messed up. But I didn't stop being the lover here. Yeah, and I think it's important also for us to remember that when he when he expresses that love, I think so much of what God is trying to do when he demonstrates his love for us is I think he's actually seeking to call us back mm. to that original design that was not tainted by sin, that was not that had an innocence to it. You know, if you think about it, when when God comes to you, Stephen, in love, even 
if you have blown it? What does that correction in your life look like? Does it look like shame? Does it look like condemnation? No, I think what it looks like is God saying, Stephen, I know that you did. I have, a, I have forgiveness that's for you through what Christ did on the cross. And you know what? I want to remind you about the garden. I want to remind you about the original plan. You've said this before. We were originally intended to run around naked in a garden. Right. You know, the idea Innocent. of can yes. you come back to that goodness? His love is always calling us back to yes. that design of yes. innocence and purity. Yes. That's good. So <clears throat> we're full of testosterone and energy and sexuality, and he called man good, right? And he chooses to use men. He fully knew that men would mess up. Mm-hmm. But he chose to use men to do his work. Now, isn't that interesting? He could have created a third being that said, okay, you're the worker that's going to get everything done because this male is going to mess up. But he didn't. He knew we would mess up. He knew that we would choose sin sometimes and fail. And yet he still gave us this assignment and he still does his work through broken men. Mm-hmm. You understand? We get to lead the kingdom. And it just blows my mind because it seems like a lot of guys would be told to sit down and shut up. And you see them in the church sit down and shut up because they haven't mastered 100% their sexuality. So they sit down and shut up, live in the shadows. But he goes, I know you're struggling. I know who you are. I made you like this. And in spite of you, I'm going to have my kingdom go forward. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that insight is amazing to me because that's not what we hear. We hear condemnation, sit down, shut up, get it together, don't lead until you're perfect. And yet God says the kingdom's going to go on with imperfect beings. Yeah, think about it this way. So from the very beginning, uh, this is what I believe is that God made man responsible. So you see that. Even when Eve was the one who sinned first, God said he held Adam responsible, Mm. right? So there's there's this responsibility that was given to man. And even when man broke that, you know what, God, God did not say, therefore, I've got to find somebody else to be responsible. Right. I think of it this way, too. One of the stories that came to my mind as you were saying that was the story of Peter. You know, in the very early moments when Jesus first met Peter, he told him what? I'll make you fishers of men. Mm. He gave him his call. He gave him his, resp- his, his, his mission. Well, you know what, Peter then... The Lord prophesying said, you know what, you're going to deny me three times before, you know, the next day, whenever he was going to be crucified. And he did it, and then he went, went away and wept bitterly. And I'm sure Peter was thinking, that's it. I've failed too deeply to, to ever be used by God again. Mm. But when Jesus on the shore, after his resurrection, restores Peter, you know what? He didn't change his mission. He's like, you are going to still be my man. Follow me. Yeah. And I love that because it's kind of like, mm, it's that's exactly good. what you're talking about. God is saying to to you and to me, I've made you or I've given you responsibility, knowing that you guys are going to mishandle it. Right. So, I mean, I'll take it personally. God's saying, Jonathan, I know you're going to mishandle the responsibility that I've given you. Mm. It doesn't change the fact that I'm going to keep holding you responsible and growing you in that responsibility. I have a mission for you, and you know, because it's my mission— it can't be thwarted. I'm going to still do it. Yes. Even as you stumble along the way. And, and I, it's funny, we grow into that mission, right? We go into that call, right? Because we'll, we'll get diverted and deviated mm-hmm. and sidetracked and we'll get all caught up in the lower little mission versus the big God mission that he wants to literally grow us into. And I think the important message through that is that we recognize that this is a call of grace, on our lives. Yes, he's made us yes. responsible and we've blown it, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean he discards us. Right. He's like, I'm right. going to give you what you don't deserve and I'm going to keep working on you as you grow in your, in well, your understanding of it, being a male. Right. And I, I like the word grace, but I want to punctuate 
his love. Mm -hmm. Because people hear grace and they'll park the dialogue. No, it is it is his love. Your mistake, but his never ending merciful love that we're caught up in. That he loves even when you don't, when you get lost. He he still says, I got love for you, son. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you made up I, I got you made a mess, but I got you covered, son. I got more love than you have ability to sin or fall down or fail or get lost on the mission. Mm -hmm. So it, going down my list here, God does miracles in spite of men messing up. Right? Look at the men of the Bible and look at David. He was called a man after God's own heart. And he massively messed up. And yet, if God is love, and he has a vision for us, of John was talking, a mission for us, and he has a mission for his church and his people and his kingdom, we're going to be fumbling and bumbling and messing up, even with our sexuality. But he says, you made a promise to, to, be, to follow me, and I made a commitment to you. And so my love wins, not your failing. I'm not going to punctuate the story because of the mistakes you made and define you because of your mistakes. No, you loved me, and I loved you, and I made commitment. And if you fall down on your half, I will be faithful to my promise. I will be love to you even if you play in the dirt, in the mud, and you misuse and mishandle. I will wrap you in love, and I'll see that you make mistakes, but I need you to know I'm before you and behind you and under you and above you, loving on you, and you cannot out -sin my love. Mm. You cannot make messes such that my love will not cover you, so that he sees our heart. And he loves us because that's who he is. And he loves that we made a commitment to him one day. And he said, I'm going to be faithful to my promise. I'm going to be faithful to the promise I made to you, even if you can't be faithful to the promise you made to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, that's beautiful. And I think that's why we have to remember we are made in his image, mm. not the other way around. Yes. And so what you're saying when you talk about the love and the faithfulness of the Father to us, the love of God to us. Yes. Guess what? That's part I think part of that is because he has made us in his image. Mm. So there he's say, what he's basically saying is, listen, what I've put on you is my my face. I've put my I have to mm. I have to move toward you because I'm I'm connected to you in that way. That's that's, good. that's different from everything else that I've made. I don't have that kind of connection with a tree, oh, with yes. a mountain, with yes. the ocean. You are who I've put my image on, and therefore it's like there's a bond, there's a there's a a draw mm, that is good. undeniable. That's so he good. has to move toward us in love in that, that way. That is good. Because we get lost and we fall down and we blame and shame ourselves and we're so critical and then we hide in the shadows because we haven't mastered it. Don't forget He's not lost. Mm -hmm. You may be looking down, but he's not looking down. He has you on mission. And I love what Jonathan said. We're being grown into the bigger mission because we showed up at 12 and we found something of power and we kind of misused it. And it energizes and excited us. But it's the small mission of growing up and trying to figure out sexuality. It's not the big game. Play in the big league, not the little league. Mm-hmm. How do you close? Yeah, well, I was going to say, you know, you, you might have thought by seeing a uh, an episode that has a title like Understanding Male Sexuality that we would have been talking about things like pornography <laughs> or things like all this. And But the reality is, is we wanted to go much deeper than that because we we are made in the image of God. Therefore, we are made to love. And we are made to love as men. Yes. We're made to love in the way that God has designed us. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be unashamed about that. Uh -huh. We also need to stay on the growth mission of understanding, well, what, is, what does that actually yeah. mean? How do I actually not only perceive life through 
my male mind and my male understanding, but how do I actually live it out in the responsibilities that God has given me, the power that he's given me, the strength that he's given me, and how do I offer that up for the good of others? And so we hope this has helped you kind of take uh, get some ideas for some yes. next steps that you can take. Yes. And of course, if you have any questions or just want to share your story, we'd love to walk alongside you. So please reach out to us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on the Pure Sex Radio Program. he knows your heart. He knows your heart. He knows your commitment. And he doesn't get confused with your stupid behavior. Fight on, bro. Fight on. Yeah. Take care. Live we'll see well. You. See you next time. Bye-bye.